Have you ever had a tire blow out? It's an unpleasant surprise, isn't it? Much like a bad tire, some people have a weak spot on a brain blood vessel. Those weak spots, we call them berry aneurysms, because they generally look like small berries, sometimes do blow out. When that happens, most people will die before reaching the hospital. And sadly, those who do survive rarely go back to work. Until 1937, there was no treatment. But then a neurosurgeon, Walter Dandy, had an audacious idea. He put a silver clip across the base of an aneurysm before it had a chance to rupture. But open brain surgery is not a small undertaking, and it has its own serious complications. Patients, not surprisingly, are reluctant to have their skulls opened. In 1989, Guido Guglielmi developed a system that made open surgery unnecessary. He created small platinum coils that could be packed into aneurysm, and he introduced those coils through a tiny microcatheter inserted all the way from a patient's groin up into the brain, making most surgeries unnecessary. And this is what that treatment looks like in a patient's aneurysm replica. The goal in both treatments is to prevent the dynamic forces of blood from acting on the weak spot in the artery wall and blowing out the aneurysm. So now, instead of six to eight hours of surgery, we can pack an aneurysm with coils in two to six hours. And as you might expect, recovery time after coil treatment is much shorter than with open surgery. In North America, about 30,000 aneurysms will rupture this year. About 15,000 patients will survive and become available for treatment. Fortunately, with the widespread availability of scanning, many more patients will have their aneurysms discovered well before they rupture. In Europe, the numbers are even higher. Now you know the what and the how many of the disease. If we are to create a better treatment for this disease based upon science and fundamental physiologic principles, we need to ask the why question. Why do aneurysms form? Why do they grow? And why do they rupture? To begin to understand why, we must see, visualize, how blood actually flows and we must study the dynamic forces that act on vessels. Here in this human carotid artery replica, we can actually see the flowing slipstreams. There are three fundamental forces that act on arteries. The first of these is the outward pressure on the artery wall generated by each heartbeat. We measure this kind of pressure by squeezing the artery shut with a blood pressure cuff around our arm. Put a blood pressure cuff around this hose pump it up until there's no further flow, and we get a number that's about the same as our blood pressure. The second is a pressure we can't yet measure in humans. It's the dynamic pressure in the center of the bloodstream. In humans, it's not steady like this jet. The heart, in fact, puts out 60 or 7 jets a minute, about a billion during our lifetime. If this jet is misdirected, it can do damage to the vessel wall, and that, we believe, is what starts the aneurysm. The third force is more difficult to understand intuitively. It's called wall tension. Squeeze the tense part of an inflated balloon, and you can feel it push back. Squeeze the part that hasn't yet expanded, and you can compress it with essentially no force. If we protect the aneurysm from these three forces, and smoothly direct that jet flow away from the aneurysm, we should have a good, effective, and importantly, a long-term treatment. Now let's look at some flow dynamics in one of my patients who cannot be treated safely by today's means. This is an image from her catheter angiogram. The black is contrast agent outlining her vessels. We have recently figured out how to make anatomically correct replicas of blood vessels from CT scan data. Here is her replica in a circuit of pulsating blood-like fluid. These replicas allow us not only to do research, 
but also to practice and test methods that we hope to use for her treatment. Notice the high pressure jet of blood that goes into the aneurysm, strikes the dome, and swirls around. It's violent and turbulent, isn't it? Doesn't it make intuitive and scientific sense to redirect that turbulence away from the dome, which is the point where it's going to rupture? The question is how? Let's watch the treatment of this lady's aneurysm replica with Nucrolate. Step one is to place two balloon microcatheters adjacent to the aneurysm to create a bit of anatomy she was not born with, a flow divider, a divider that will direct the jet of flowing fluid away from that aneurysm. By the way, the small black dot in the aneurysm is the tip of the microcatheter. In a live patient, getting to this point in the procedure will take anywhere between 40 to 80 minutes. Had I then filled this aneurysm with coils, that would have taken me another one to two hours, but it would have been almost impossible because of the wide aneurysm neck. These real-time images show the physician we are training introducing the nucrolate to make a smooth interface with these two balloons. This is real-time. It takes only one to two minutes to treat most humans. He then allows about 10 seconds for polymerization to become complete, then removes the balloon microcatheters and the delivery microcatheter from the aneurysm, and finally checks blood flow by injecting a small amount of contrast agent. So you see, we've actually improved upon the anatomy she was born with. We've created a flow divider that directs blood smoothly past the aneurysm neck to go to parts of the brain where it will actually do some good. Compare the smooth flow you see here with the flow she had before our treatment. Want to see the same treatment in a live patient? This gentleman had fortunately made it to the hospital after having had a serious hemorrhage and he was treated with coils. First, here's his original angiogram. He has a large, wide neck aneurysm at the basilar tip. The coil treatment the physician performed is quite good, especially in light of that wide neck. But a year later, on his follow-up study, the aneurysm is coming back. Using the same technique, two balloon microcatheters were placed adjacent to the neck and a third microcatheter was directed into the aneurysm. It took about two minutes to introduce the nucrolate. Here's his follow-up angiogram, and now he has smooth, non-turbulent blood flow away from that neck. By the way, aneurysms in other parts of the brain are significantly easier to treat than these aneurysms at the tip of the basilar artery. So what is nucrolate? What is its chemical basis? The cyanoacrylate class of compounds, known better as crazy glues, have been around more than 50 years and are used extensively in industry and in the home. They are truly super glues. Let a liquid cyanoacrylate come in contact with blood or tissue fluid and in a second or so it will become like a piece of glass. If we add biologically compatible plasticizers, we can change the device to a flexible, biologically friendly sponge. In fact, the only property of cyanoacrylate that is priceless to us is its ability to change rapidly from a liquid to a solid. Here's how it's presented to the physician. An ampule containing a colorless liquid and a small bottle of gold dust, which gives it its radio opacity, its ability to be seen easily with an X-ray fluoroscope. Mix one into the other and inject, controlling it with the fluoroscope. It's that simple. When it touches blood, it polymerizes into an open cell sponge. The open cells allow ingrowth of fibroblasts, much like burn scar, which we believe will enhance its long-term effectiveness. In our two-year implant studies, extensive fibroblastic reaction continues to fill the pores of the sponge. This is a dark field illumination of one of our rabbit aneurysms. More importantly, the neck of the aneurysm is covered with smooth endothelium. It appears that this endothelial overgrowth occurs within two to three weeks. So why haven't cyanoacrylates been widely used in medicine? 
The answer is our Food and Drug Administration. It's only been in the last decade that a few cyanoacrylates have been given limited approval. With those approvals, it's becoming apparent that their institutional reticence is being overcome. We have deliberately chosen a life-threatening critical illness with known mortality and morbidity statistics, a disease that has no universally accepted and completely effective treatment. Yes, coils and surgery are approved, and they do work, but they simply aren't ideal. But knowing the outcomes of those treatments will allow us to do a scientifically rigorous and relatively small safety and outcomes study. Better, as we progress toward approval of our first device, minor modifications of the basic formulation, not requiring additional benchtop testing, will allow us simultaneously to field devices useful in treating much more common diseases, endovascular leaks that occur during abdominal aortic aneurysm treatment, and endovascular treatment of uterine fibroids, for example. In summary, this is not a clever new invention looking for a problem to solve. The problem, cerebral berry aneurysm, is well known and understood, and this device, Nucrolate, effectively and rapidly treats aneurysms. Let's now answer the nine questions that a smart investor will always ask. Well, the movie has answered that question. The treatment is fast, easy to perform, and most importantly, corrects the underlying pathologic flow dynamics that caused the aneurysm to form in the first place. Most treatments take only one to two minutes. Surgery, costly in terms of patient pain, time to perform, and dollars, and not as effective as the newer treatment coils. Coils take about half the time of surgery, a few hours, and half as many dollars. I use, on average, four coils per case, about $1,300 a coil, and if I need also to put in a stent, that costs another $4,500. In America, close to 40,000 patients a year and growing. The European numbers are much higher. At present, more than half of European patients are treated with coils. Unfortunately, we don't have hard data for the rest of the world. Well, that's proprietary, but most investors would be happy with the margin. Our first two patents are pending. One has had an office action, and others are under preparation. But just as important, it is extremely difficult to make medical grade cyanoacrylates. So there's plenty of trade secret. Through a cohesive and small network of enthusiastic physicians, about 600 in all, the buzz is already there as we have presented three papers on nucrolates use and are scheduled to present three more in the next six months. Eventually, of course, a sales force and distribution network will have to be organized. All ancillary equipment is readily available now. The microcatheters, guide wires, and fluoroscopy units are already well known in this community. The physician can use his own favorite guide wires and catheters. Well, yes, Nucrolate is best seen as a platform technology. Once the initial approval has been gained, Nucrolate will have much wider use in abdominal procedures, especially, we believe, for uterine artery embolization and to plug endovascular leaks simply by changing the additives. No further testing should be required. The product is already developed. The chief variable in time to sales is the American FDA, and we have already submitted all requirements to them for a full pre-market approval. 
Valor has been inspected by the California Department of Health and has received our manufacturing license for commercial operation. All our operations are performed under strict QSR principles. We are also proceeding rapidly through the European CE Mark process and have recently received ISO certification from NEMCO, the European notified body. Even better, two trial sites in Europe are operational and in the next three months, an additional three sites in UK will be running. As such, Valor should not be seen as an early research company, but rather as an established emerging medical device corporation. If you have other questions, please call us.